So, Pastor Don and I are uh, tag teaming, I think, for most of December. I think Tyler might be coming in right at the very end of December to take a message. But the theme or sort of where we're going to go with our Christmas messages is the names of Jesus. Uh, That's what we want to consider. Uh, Although... If you know anything about preaching and how that works, I'm going to give uh, Don just the full freedom that maybe by next week that theme might have changed, uh, because often that's what happens when you start to prepare, something else kind of comes out of the passage, but in what we've thought so far, we're going to look at the names of Christ, and so I'd invite you to open your Bible to uh, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, it's one of those familiar passages, as soon as we start to read it, uh, you'll be familiar with it. But yeah, it's Isaiah chapter 9, and uh, we'll read in at verse 1. So Isaiah chapter 9, reading at verse 1. And the heading in my Bible says, For to us a child is born. It says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping Uh, the tramping warrior and battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire for to us a child is born for to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Just reading so far, I'm sure you picked up on it, but the verse that I want to focus on is verse 6, and in in particular those four names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Just a couple of things to consider before we look right at this passage. As you come to Isaiah, one of the things you're going to notice is contrasts. You see it even in this passage as well. And this contrast of of, um, judgment and of exile and invasion and punishment. And then you see just these sort of rays of promise. And this contrast of just a nation that in a sense, because of their sin, are already in trouble, but then more so that, that, that impending invasion that was to come. And then, as I said, just in contrast to that, you see hope and a future and just brightness that comes. And so you're going to see, as you read through Isaiah, the contrasts. So keep that in mind as we work our way through the passage. I might highlight a few of those as we uh, work our way through. Now, related to the passage... Where is the land of Zebulun and Naphtali? See that there in verse 1? Uh, in the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And so then the, the rest of the passage is related to what he's going to do in those two places or in that area, Naphtali and Zebulun. Well, really, Zebulun and Naphtali, they were sons of Jacob. Um, Zebulun uh, is really... Um, yeah, it's the word for gift. Um, and then Naphtali is the name for struggle. And it comes out of, I believe it's Genesis 29, and that passage of just really unhealthy relationships um, between Jacob and Leah and Rachel. Um, and yet, basically, what had happened was these areas of Israel were named after uh, Zebulun and Naphtali. It's kind of in northern Israel, close to the Sea of Galilee. Um, and so that's really what he's speaking about, sort of the north part of Israel in particular is 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 
Zebulun and Naphtali. They're kind of weird names to say. Um, what's interesting about them uh, is that it's not the only place it's mentioned. Whenever you jump over to Matthew 4 and 12 to 17, and this is Jesus beginning his ministry. And um, now when he heard that John had been arrested, this is Jesus, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and he lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then the quotes from our passage in Isaiah. And so Jesus' earthly ministry, a lot of it took place in these, in these two areas. Um, and so the contrast in Isaiah, keep an eye on that. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali, just that north part of Israel, um, is really the other thing that we want to keep our eye on. The third thing I want to just draw attention to real quick as I go by is, um, what is prophecy? Now, oh, some of you guys are thinking, oh boy, we're never getting out of here. A real quick passing uh, comment on that. Um, so if, again, we're thinking of the Old Testament. We're thinking of prophets, and that was how God would speak to people. And so God would say to the prophet, hey, go to these people and bring a message. Sometimes it was uh, speak to them. Sometimes it was write the message down. And so these were the prophets in the Old Testament sense who would bring that message to the people. And that's really what Isaiah is. It's, it's a record of Isaiah, the prophet, bringing this message to Israel. Sometimes part of that prophecy was what was going to happen in the future, right? And so you, you, you guys are familiar with that word. And sometimes it was like a conditional prophecy. If you don't obey, then this is what's going to happen. But if you obey, then God will do and do something different. And so there's just that sense in which they were describing part of it, as well as bringing God's word to the people, was also saying, hey, this is what's going to happen in the future. And what's really interesting is in the Bible in particular, well, only in the Bible, uh, the... the the prophecies all come true. Uh, that's a really neat thing. And a lot of the prophecies, it's interesting, when you read it in the context of the Old Testament passage, it's just amazing to think of what God had revealed through that prophet. But yet a lot of that fulfillment was seen in Christ and will be seen in Christ, even at his second coming. And so when you're thinking of, of Isaiah, when you're thinking of this kind of message, um, when he's speaking, this stuff hasn't already happened. But he's speaking it as if it will happen. It's kind of like what Pastor Don has been bringing up. It's, a, it's obviously in Hebrew, so it's not in the Greek. But it's, it's that same sense where it's so certain that it's going to happen. That whenever we work our way through this, he's speaking as if it's already happened. Um, and so there's just that, that comfort that we have when we think of prophecy. That it's just that reminder of God keeps his word. If you were to boil it down to the simplest thing is God, when we read those prophecies, we are reminded God is faithful to keep his word. And so keep that in mind as we're working through this. This was a message that Isaiah was bringing to the people. And he was talking about what was going to happen in the future. And ultimately when we read in that Matthew passage what Christ was going to fulfill. Uh, last thing to note before we get to the passage is note um, God is controlling everything. God is in control. Look at verse 1 of chapter 9. Uh, there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea. You've got God bringing the people of or the land of Zebulun and Naphtali into contempt. And then you've got him making a glorious the way. It's interesting, whenever the Bible speaks of future history, it's always with that position that God is completely in control. God is completely in control. Now, that leaves a lot of questions sometimes when we wonder, how is this playing out and how is this under a certain situation under God's control? But there's just that surety as you read through scriptures that God is in control. And just that in those low times, in that gloom and in the desolation of the land, that, that God had ordained to those things, so still that God was going to bring forth and make glorious the way. Um, so let's get to these terms that we see about him. He's the wonderful counselor. That's the first name that we see about the Lord Jesus. He's the wonderful counselor. Huh. That word wonderful, it's the same root word as marvelous and miraculous or incomprehensible. It's to see something that we can't, we can't grasp, but we, we can see it, it's real, but we can't fathom how it's happening. 
I don't know what happens uh, around your house, what your Christmas traditions are. One of we had hasn't happened yet this year, um, but what'll happen some night when we should really be home and have our kids in bed, maybe after leaving Bethlehem Star, something like that. There, Melissa will say over to me. I'm typically driving, and she'll say, "Hey." Let's go look at the Christmas lights. And so instead of going home and being sensible and putting our kids to bed, um, we drive around for however long we can bear it and um, look at the Christmas lights. And it's interesting the categories that we have come up with. We, they're not official categories, not official awards, but there's just some that understated elegance would be one category. It's just, I don't know if it's the shape of the house or the color of the lights or what it is, but it's just amazing. And it's like, whoa, that's amazing. And then there's like the overdone, like what were you thinking, which still is, you know, it, it deserves an award of some description. And they've got it all. They've got the inflatables. They've got the projector lights. They've got the eaves trough lights. You know, they've just got everything. Um, and then, of course, here in Burnham, we got, I think, two places that have the radio broadcasting. You guys know that where you tune your radio to a certain frequency and you hear the music and the lights are synced to it and that's impressive as well. Um, But there's always one. There's always one that seems to be the favorite. And I don't know, sometimes it's hard to know why that one was the favorite. Um, I don't think it was the lights were brighter. I don't think that it was anything along those lines, but there's just one that was it. Yep, that was the one that did it for us this year. Sometimes you go back and it's totally different the next year. Now thinking about this category of wonderful, it's that concept of amongst those lights, there's really not, from the best to the worst, you can kind of see the spectrum. And yet, to think of wonder, to think of just things that are amazing, There's this category that maybe we would normally think of people that are wonderful or a wonderful event or a wonderful day and then to think of Christ as the wonderful counselor. It's just another category altogether. It's the same word, wonderful, but it's not just that you're putting it on that same level as a wonderful day or a wonderful person, but that's really that incomprehensible. How do you fathom his wonder? How do you fathom just his beauty? How do we see that wonder or even sort of glimpses of that, that sort of incomprehensible category? I got thinking of Solomon in terms of wisdom, thinking of maybe more of the counselor part. So Solomon says of him that all Israel heard of the judgment that the king, that Solomon had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was with him to do justice. So even there you get a hint that the wisdom that he had was God's wisdom. Um, But yet again, as I say, then comes the Christ. He didn't need a counselor. One of the commentators I read was speaking of that, that typically kings and governments, and that's really what this passage is speaking about. It's speaking about a a government, a time when it would change from um, oppression to one who would come and would rule perfectly. The Messiah would come and would rule perfectly. But yet he didn't need a counselor. He didn't need a, a wisdom team just to help him to come up with decisions. He didn't need a team of people who would say, don't do this or stop doing that. Christ needed no one and will need no one. We see his wisdom in creation. Colossians 1 and 16 to 18 says, For by him, this is by Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's a sermon right there, but it's, it's just that, that picture of just that wisdom of Christ seen in creation. It was through him, it was for him, he is before all things, and then he holds all things together. In him all things hold together. We see his wisdom in creation, we see his counsel or his wisdom in the teaching and the miracles. There was a crowd that went into Capernaum, and there on the Sabbath, Sabbath day, he was teaching, Jesus was teaching, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Immediately there was a, in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing, crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And in the crowd, this is how they respond. They were all amazed. 
So that they questioned amongst themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread throughout all that surrounding region of Galilee. There's just that wisdom in how Jesus taught. There was a difference. He's a wonderful counselor. He was described as the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Think about that for a second. We don't, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong in this, but I think we've maybe moved away from value and wisdom and education. It seems to be, I, I don't know, I, I don't even know if my generation does it as much as, I think of my dad who just seemed to always be learning. It was always, any free time he had, it would take out a book and learn about something. Uh, and he just valued education. Um, he just seemed to value knowing more and being able to implement that knowledge and implement that wisdom. And yet to think of Christ. And it says in him were all the treasures of wisdom. And it's not just speaking about the knowledge like I'm speaking about with my dad trying to learn stuff. But the, the treasures of God himself. The very wisdom of God and knowledge of God. So we see in him this wonderful counselor. It's his name. We'll call him wonderful counselor because that wisdom and that counsel that he gives is just amazing. We're amazed by it. Um, and so we come to, we recognize his first name there is wonderful counselor. And we see he's the mighty God. He's the mighty God. That's his second name that he will be called. What's interesting about this is the name for God here in the Hebrew is the word El. And literally, El means strong God. That's the emphasis of that word. It's emphasizing a God who is strong. And yet, the writer, um, when he's writing it down, or when he's inspired to write it down, he says he's mighty God. So it's literally mighty, strong God. He's just emphasizing that all-powerfulness of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Emphasizing that he's God. It's interesting, whenever you, if you were to Google this passage and you were to look it up, there's some uh, of the, the, like the references in Google that you can tell, oh yeah, I'd agree with that, and I'd agree with that. But it's also interesting, there's a lot of references trying to say why this doesn't actually say that he's God. It can't mean that he's God. And, and just a number of websites that are trying to explain why this really doesn't mean God. It means a different term for God. And yet throughout this, whether you go back to, I believe it's in chapter 7 and Emmanuel and God with us, or even further in Isaiah, or even in the scriptures in general, it's just clear to see that Christ is God. And that he is mighty God, that emphasis on his power, that emphasis on who he is. Um, Psalm 24 and verse 8 says, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Um, and so we see... Um, yeah, let me read Matthew 1 and 22 as well. It says, She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That was the part I was wanting to get to, the Emmanuel part, which means God with us. Again, that he is God. Now I want to wrap up, not right now, but when I come to the end, I want to wrap up just with how do we apply this. But just think about this, uh, just a little hint of where I want to apply it just as, as we pause here before we move to the next name. When we think of the mighty God, and we think of God who is all-powerful, I don't know what your week looks like. I think of some of our volunteers here at the church. There's a tent that has to go up. There's a pile of food that has to be brought together. There's sound stuff that has to work seamlessly. There's a whole bunch of like electrical plugs that are going to be plugged in. And this old, not old, old building, but an older building, is sometimes that can cause trouble. But maybe it's a level sort of above that, if I can say it that way. Maybe this week it's like our family, the Shreves, like maybe they're dealing with the fact of sickness overseas. To remember that Jesus is a mighty God. That's the point. His name is mighty God because his character is the one who is mighty. And that he wants us to, to know that. And he wants that to be a comfort to us. We'll come back to that a bit more at the end. The next one is everlasting father. 
Uh, we've seen wonderful counselor, we've seen mighty God, and then everlasting father. Now again, some of those websites I was talking about, they have a hard time with this, because for some of them they're like, oh, what does this mean? Is Christ, is he not the son, but he's the father? Therefore it's confusing, it's not Trinitarian, it's not the father, son, and Holy Spirit. Don't think that's where he's trying to go with the passage. I think it's more speaking of that way that God and the Bible speak about the role of the father, and the quality the biblical qualities for a father. Um, You can see that um, when you look at Psalm 103 and verse 13, as the father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. See that high role, that high um, position that fathers are to have? They're to be compassionate to their children. You ever had this happen, dads? You're working away at something, you got 30 minutes to do a 40 minute job, and your kids come and start asking questions. What are you doing? And then the next level is they want to help you. (laughs) Dad, could I do that? (sighs) Oh boy. Um, It's not a very compassionate moment around our house. Um, I can tell you that. And yet I've had to learn. I've had to learn to be compassionate. And you can learn. That's the more amazing part is God is gracious. He grants us compassion that we need. Um, And sometimes it also comes back to realizing I need to do better with my time management. That's sometimes the heart of the issue, which I hate to admit. But as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. It's from the lesser to the greater. Dads typically would show compassion to their kids. The Lord, in a bigger way, shows compassion to those who fear him. Another passage that just outlines his role of father. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. <clears throat> For the Lord reproves him whom he loves. As a father, the son in whom he delights. I don't know if we like this one as much. Um, Um, But it's really that admonition that don't despise the Lord's discipline because in the same way a father who loves his son is going to discipline his son, so our Heavenly Father is going to show that same quality. He's going to discipline his children for our good. And so again, you see this, again, this biblical pattern of what a dad is, of what a father is. Or Luke 11, 11 to 13, what what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will you will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to, to those who ask him? Again, from the lesser to the greater. If your son would ask you for something, fish, or um, you know, you're not going to give him a serpent or an egg, you're not going to give him a scorpion. They seem rather obscure examples. I just can't think that you would think fish oh no, give him a serpent, or egg, no, no, I'll give him a scorpion. Like it just, it's hard quite just to connect, but I get the, where it's going, but it's just hard to see, think that, that that's what would, you know, land on the people back then, that they would get it. Anyway, but if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so again, it's this picture of God as a good father. And this is speaking of our heavenly father. Now, coming back to our passage, how does this apply here? We're speaking of the name of Jesus, not that he is the father and is in the father, son, and spirit, but we're speaking of this reign, this rule, this government that will be upon his shoulders. And part of that rule will be that he rules like a father with that compassion, or he disciplines, or that he you know, gives good gifts, he's kind, and so that, that sort of the qualities of a father will be seen in Christ. The everlasting part just speaks to the fact that his kingdom will never end. You get that more as you go through the passage 7 through to 9, you get a little bit more of that kingdom that will never end. And so again, it's one of those names. When we think of Christ, we think of his reign that will never end. He's everlasting, has always been. Even though we're speaking about the son and a baby being born and uh, that, that we read off, um, yet he's always been. He's always been there and always will be there. And also to, to add a little thing to that would be the fact that he's immutable. He never changes. There's no updates needed. He doesn't think less of us. He doesn't diminish in his love for us. And he doesn't increase in his love for us. He's unchangeable. And so we see that third name, the everlasting father. 
Then the Prince of Peace. Christ will be a peaceful prince and not a tyrant. You see, that's the context, right? Where the yoke will be broken, uh, the staff, uh, the, like those instruments of oppression, they have been broken, and then the weapons of war have been burnt up. And really, it's speaking of the change between the gloom of oppression to this light and the glorious way that's coming uh, under the rule of the Lord Jesus. And instead of him being oppress- an oppressive reign like what they've experienced, he will be the prince of peace, not a tyrant. His, his reign will not be marked by fighting and discord, but by health, perfect happiness, blessed and calm safety. Huh. That's his rule and his reign. It's a rule and a reign of peace. I'm sure you've had that experience even in your week. Even this week I was reminded of this. There was a a morning where I was praying and to be quite honest, I was, I don't know if I was overwhelmed, might be too strong, but I was certainly just aware of all that I had to do that day. And I trying to pray, trying to pray, trying to pray, really couldn't get anywhere with it. Just focused on A, B, C, and D or whatever. And just like that, a passage came to me about, hey, be at peace. I got this. It was kind of funny because Calvin had left his little toy helicopter. So it's actually a sharpener. But this is going to be a hard picture to get. But on the side of it, it's, it's Christian stationery. You know that overpriced stationery? So it's got a verse printed on it. Puts the value up by about $5. Um, and so um, it's, he will guide you. Just glanced at it as where I was walking and praying. Just seeing he will guide you. And just that awareness of peace. That awareness that, oh yeah, today's going to be a bit of a zoo. But he's going to guide me. There's that subjective sense to it. But yet we read, of course, in Romans 5 and 1, when we're thinking of Christ and his peace, uh, we read, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Prince of Peace because he has brought peace between us, between his people and God. There's no enmity. There's no, nothing between us. But rather, through his death, his life and death on the cross, we can experience that peace. And so we were reminded to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful. And so we see these four names. The Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A couple of ways I want to finish it up here this morning. Um, Psalm 34. I was praying about this even this week as I was preparing I was actually, for those who are into the music, you should listen to the Shane and Shane version of Psalm 34. It's very bluesy and excellent. It says, O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I wonder this time of Christmas, and these names, and the four that I focused on this morning, I wonder, is it a testimony like this is? That's what I was praying for this week. I was praying that even as in that sort of magnifying the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. I was praying for us as a church that as we come together for these four or five weeks, whatever it is, that there would just be that sense of getting together to worship Christ for who he is. And that his character would amaze us and captivate us once more. As we think even on these things, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, that testimony that comes that that even as we have looked to him there's just that radiance that we have experienced and that confidence that we will never be ashamed and that as we have cried to him and I trust you have cried to him and experienced that the Lord has heard him and has saved him from all his troubles and so even as we come to communion even as we head into this week just to be that sense of magnifying the Lord for who he is and for what he has done for us. There's also one other little application there in verse 8. It says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. 
See, again, the Christmas time is a time of invitation, right? We want to get together as families. I know sometimes that can bring a bit of stress, but you get the, the concept of inviting people over at Christmas. And yet here is also a time of invitation, a time when we would invite you to taste and to see that the Lord is good. Maybe here this morning, and those names mean nothing to you. That peace seems foreign to you. Just no kind of, it doesn't jive with you. You can't identify with those things. Um, and yet here's the key to it. Taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. There's that experiential aspect of it. And what we're talking about, if you put it into sort of like a, a New Testament picture, what we're saying is uh, that, that, that awareness of the necessity of faith in Christ, of repentance from our sins, that turning from confidence in ourselves, and that realization that Christ has, has done it all. I wanted to read one little thing, and then with this I am done. So I, I read um, Calvin had a sermon on this passage, and I loved the way he finished it off, and I was going to put it into my own words, and then I thought, no, I'll just read it how it is. I trust this will be an encouragement to you this week. Now to, now to apply this for our own instruction, so this is the Isaiah 9 and 6 passage. Um, now to apply this for our own instruction, when, whenever any distrust arises, and all means of escape are taken away, away from us, whenever in, in short it appears to us that everything is in a ruinous condition, let us recall to our remembrance that Christ is called wonderful because he has an inconceivable methods of assisting us and because his power is far beyond what we are able to conceive. When we need counsel, let us remember that he is the counselor. When we need strength, let us remember that he is mighty and strong. When new terrors spring up suddenly every instant, and when many deaths threaten us from various quarters, let us rely on that eternity of which he is with good reason called the Father. And by the same comfort, let us learn to soothe all temporal distress when we are inwardly tossed by our various tempests or storms. And when Satan attempts to disturb our consciences, let us remember that Christ is the Prince of Peace and that it is easy for him to quickly allay or calm all our uneasy feelings. Thus, with these titles, confirm us more and more in the faith of Christ and fortify us against Satan and against hell itself.